Okay, you've got a healthy 347. How much is a big cam worth? How much is a carb spacer worth? There's only one way to find out. Hello everybody, Armor Shoulder, and as always, welcome to the channel. It is Sunday fun day, that can only mean one thing, a small block forward power, specifically 347 small block forward power, and a pretty good one to begin with. What happens when you run a carb spacer on a single plane intake manual? What happens when you step up from a pretty aggressive hydraulic roller cam to a very aggressive solid roller cam? I mean, this 347 already had a lot going for it to begin with. It was high compression. It was a 347. It had good Airflow Research 205 heads on it. But what happens when we really step up and camshaft? I don't know. Let's check it out. Okay, guys, let's jump right in and demonstrate the testing on our 347-inch stroker small block forward. We did a very cool spacer test and then a pretty good-sized camshaft upgrade going from a hydraulic roller to a solid roller profile. And not just a solid roller, but a fairly healthy one, especially for a 347. Certainly not something that you'd want to probably try in your daily driver, but let's take a look. So let's start off with our test motor. 347 inches. We took a production 5-liter hydraulic roller block. We added a 3.4 inch stroker crank from SCAT. We added 5.4 inch forged rods and then forged 40 over piston. So this thing was actually a little bit better than, or a little bit bigger than 347 inches. It was a flat top piston with dual valve reliefs because we were going to run multiple different kinds of cylinder heads on this. We started off with a fairly healthy camshaft. It was an extreme energy. 282 camshaft. Yes, I know we didn't do the 274 cam that I always do, but the 282 offered a 565, 575 lift split, a 232, 240 degree duration split, and 112 degree lobe separation angle. It was basically, you know, let's call it an EFI cam, but a fairly good size EFI camshaft. So to take advantage of our displacement, and our camshaft, we had a pretty good set of heads on here. So this was a 347 stroker and a pretty good size cam. So we put a set of Airflow Research 205 heads on it. Normally on these small blocks, we would run a, a 185 head, like on the 302 stuff and 331, and on most 347s also. But we stepped up our game to the 205 head, thinking that we were going to be wanting to make fairly good power. So the 205 heads definitely flow more than the 185. We ran an Edelbrock Victor Jr. intake manifold on this and a single plane running at higher engine speeds to go along with our camshaft. We ran, uh, tried a 750 and an 850 carburetor. They both made similar power in this combination. We ran inch and three quarter long tube headers. We ran 1.6 crane or comp gold roller rockers. Obviously, hardened push rods, double roller, timing chain, all that stuff. We also had a Mylodon uh, oil pan, and we had this one. We ran a high volume oil pump. Normally, I run a standard volume, but this had a a big enough oil pan and res and reservoir, so we we stepped up to a high volume pump. Honestly, probably not even necessary. It's way more important than you have a good pan and a windage tray and that kind of stuff to actually help you make power. Uh, I found, especially on the 5 liter Fords, a normal standard volume oil pump is usually more than enough. We had an MSD distributor. We had a 6AL uh, ignition amplifier. Again, not that that's really necessary, but it was required for the distributor that we were running because it wasn't... A, um, it was a distributor that required an ignition amplifier. So we ran that combination. And then we started out with running our 282 cam and our Edelbrock Victor Jr. intake manifold. And after dialing in our carburetor and timing, this thing ran best with 35 degrees of total timing. We were rewarded with 487 horsepower and 455 foot-pounds of torque. So now let's take a look and see what happened when we added the first test that we did because it's very simple and this is something that we normally try on most carbureted applications. Hey, we have a spacer. Let's just put it on there. We put the long studs in there. This was a one inch uh, open Wilson spacer. Let's take a look at that. So we ran the spacer with a single plane intake manifold. Normally we don't see big power gains from running an open spacer on a single plane intake manifold. Sometimes we do. We actually lost power down low, picked up a little in the middle here above 5,000 and out at the peak was essentially the same power output. And I'm going to show you why uh, in just a second, why we think that there was a change in in power there down low up to about 5,000 RPM. So let's take a look at the air fuel curve, the change in the, in the air fuel curve just from the spacer. 
I want to show you the effect of what happened adding the spacer did to our carbureted combination with the single plane. It didn't have a dramatic effect up top as we'll see and there wasn't really a change in power up there but there was a change down lower in the RPM range so this was with our uh, 282 cam the Victor Jr. intake manifold but no spacer and here's what happened when uh, I showed you the power change when we added the spacer and you could see it had very little change up here at uh, 5500 even 6000 that's just kind of the the range of repeatability of the air fuel from one run to another but we did see a, a, a change below 5000 rpm the biggest change here at 4700 it went from 128 and got fairly lean at 13.6, which is probably why it made less power. And I know all the guys are going to say, hey, but yeah, now, now you need to jet it. Um, and we did throw jets at it. But the best that we could make was the same power that it made without the spacer. So, And the other problem is when we threw jet at it, we could also lose power at the top of the RPM range. And that's one of the considerations you have to have when you start jetting things. I know it would be ideal to jet it just at 6,000 RPM, but that's very, very difficult with a carburetor. So when we're trying to fix part of the air fuel curve in one RPM range, we end up also adjusting the air fuel curve on the other range. And now please make a comment on, Richard, you just need to do the high speed air blades because that will only affect the top end, which is something that I've actually never seen but now let's take a look and see what happens when we made a big change in this thing, and that is the camshaft. Okay, we have our 347 with our airflow research heads. It's uh, over 11 to 1 compression, so, you know, it's got some pretty good pop to it. We've got our single plane intake manifold. It's making decent power, but we have a 282 extreme energy hydraulic roller cam, and we're thinking, you know what we need to do? is we need to step up in camshaft. We need, to, we need to have a camshaft that will better take advantage of what these Airflow Research 205 heads, heads have to offer. I mean, after all, they flow a good bit over 300 CFM, even in the lift range that we're looking at, which we want to push something over 600 lift so we could take advantage of the big flow number. So we did exactly that. In fact, we didn't just step up to a bigger hydraulic roller cam. We stepped up to a solid roller cam, meaning that this thing now was probably <laughs> much less like street than it was transitioning towards street strip and actually more just as a strip motor. But the camshaft that we chose was an extreme energy uh, 292R camshaft, meaning it was a solid roller camshaft. That particular cam was a 621-627 lift split. So we would we had stepped up, you know, 50, 60 thousandths in lift, which is a pretty good bit. Minus the lash, of course, when we ran this thing actually with a fairly tight lash. The duration was up quite a bit too. 254 to 60. Pretty good step up in duration. So we know this is, this thing is definitely going to want to run more engine speed. And even a tighter LSA for all you LSA guys. This one had 110 degree LSA. So everything about it was basically more in terms of camshaft compared to our 282 hydraulic roller. Let's take a look and see what happened when we installed our camshaft. You can see it made a lot more power. Peak power jumped up from 487 horsepower up to 538 horsepower. And here's a question I have here, and, and torque was up uh, minimally because most of the power gains came past like 5,000 RPM, but 464 foot-pounds of torque. So here's my question for you. This thing made peak power at 6,100 or 200 with that 282 camshaft. Was there a problem, like let's say with valve control with that hydraulic roller cam? What was going on with this? I would think that a 232 cam would make peak power on a 347 a little bit higher than that. So let me know in the comments what you think. And then while you're doing that, I can tell you that we ran the same spring package on both of these combinations. We knew ahead of time that we were going to be putting in a 600 plus lift camshaft in this thing. So we put in springs accordingly. We put solid roller springs in this thing that had not only enough uh, coil bind clearance for a 650 lift camshaft, but also enough spring rate to allow us to run at the RPM range that a camshaft that has 254 and 260 degrees of duration. Honestly, I think this this thing could have used probably a Super Victor intake manifold. We tried a 750 and an 850 carburetor, basically made the same power with both of them. We didn't see a big change in power from stepping up from, these were both Demon carburetors, from stepping up in carburetor. So let me know what you guys think. This thing actually made pretty good power, like I said, 530... 
seven or 537.5. So if you round up, that's 538 horsepower. So it did fairly well. It took a fairly big camshaft. We're still not taking advantage of all the power that's available from those airflow research cylinder heads. Like I said, 315 or 320 CFM. If we can get something out in the 700 lift range, we could make even more power armature holder. Please make sure, like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, do all that stuff. I'll keep testing.